Uh, thanks a lot for this uh, kind invitation uh, to this beautiful workshop and this amazing and serene panel. Uh, so, so today I will be talking about some work which has not been published yet, but hopefully will be published this month or, or early in the new year. So a part of it is already published, but uh, uh, most of it has not been. So this is about uh, the black hole complementarity principle, which has been, of course, uh, a very old standing one since 1990s, but uh, it has been attacked by various people. But uh, uh, one clear thing is that this principle itself is not very strictly laid down. So we would like to see if uh, there is some microstate model that actually can tell us what the principle <coughs> actually is and how, to, how it is realized from microscopic dynamics. So uh, the idea is I simply give a small motivation for microstate models, why it's important. And then before going to actual microstate models, we will discuss two toy models, which would be, uh, will be illustrate how this black hole complementarity can work. So you have these two copies of information coming out, and information copied twice, but without cloning, or without encountering paradoxes. So it will be the NADS2, which I will call the trumpet, uh, following this nice terminology of uh, Clifford Johnson. And uh, we will have these models where we couple a single NADS2 with a qubit and some quantum harmonic oscillator to illustrate this. And this will be quite fascinating, the results. And then I will discuss a simple microstate model, which was already published, where we already had some nice results, I think. And uh, now we will come back uh, to the evaporating microstate where we will bring the older results and uh, then I will continue. Uh, so, yeah. so, I would also mention that we wrote a nice review in EPJC, which is in a special volume, uh, so where we uh, give a lot of introduction to bulk reconstruction and also black hole. Uh, recent progress into understanding page of black holes and all this. And uh, then, uh, the, as I said, the most of the work is being done with my student, Tanay Kipe, and uh, my colleague, Prabha, who is a student, who is a former student of John Preston. So I start with some motivation. So here, actually, I will not have anything very uh, special to say, so I will go rather superficial and quick uh, for this part. Uh, so the <coughs> black hole complementarity Principle was originally uh, proposed by such kind of Thorakia Zalukum, 1993, and uh, essentially the proposal was uh, to resolve the information loss paradox if we assume some things, uh, some, some things that we should not sacrifice, then you end up with the conclusion that information is copied twice. One is uh, a copy of it is accessible inside the black hole, uh, of informing observer can accept, can access one copy. And the asymptotic observer can decode the same information from the Hawking radiation, at least for a whole black hole. And but no observer can verify both copies. And uh, so, and it's basically claimed to be a consequence of these four uh, principles, which is unitary field correlation process, and that there is an effective field theory and equivalence principle at the horizon. And then there is one fundamental dogma that distant observer will see the black hole as a whole as a system with discrete energy spectrum, and uh, there is also no drama in falling of the should see as new horizon. So, so this kind of thing was attacked, as you know, by uh, AMPS and Mathur. Actually, uh, Mathur was saying more in the context of whether you need small corrections to, uh, to, 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 to have unitarity in popping radiation, but AMPS actually was using some strong sovereignty to attack the black hole complementary itself. So uh, essentially, if you take, take this three uh, tripartite system, the early radiation, late radiation, and interior, so and if for a sufficient old black hole where half of uh, where half at least half of the mass has been sort of evaporated away, so if you so the uh, the late the, the, the late radiation uh, will be maximally entangled with both the interior mode if TFT holds at the horizon, and also with the uh, late radiation, uh, early radiation, because it will start to purify the early radiation. 
So uh, that highly strong subjectivity of uh, entanglement entropy, and this is why it was said that there is a problem with this black hole complementarity. And uh, essentially, two kind of resolutions have been given. Uh, so one is that the reverse space cannot be factorized. The interior is encoded in a state dependent way at the boundary. I think the state dependent uh, was a very key insight was first brought in by Papa Vivas and Sumer. But Hayden and Pennington in 2018 put, put this in the language of uh, subsistent quantum error correction. <coughs> and, uh, and then there is, uh, so these are the Sanskrit words. It is taken from Amartya Sen's theory of social justice. That for any, you need something in a matter of principle and also a matter of practice. And the second one is uh, that uh, it, would take, uh, it would take exponential time in the entropy at the time of emission of this uh, late radiation because you need to distill a copy of uh, from the R, 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 a subspace Rb from the early radiation, which will purify the late radiation. And this and this distillation would take time exponential in the entropy. So basically, you cannot see both copies because you cannot decode, you cannot you cannot decode it and then jump inside the black hole and and see the other copy of information. So that's why really, it, it protects the black hole complementarity. And think time in Priscilla actually made, a, made this argument in a more rigorous way. And uh, in more generally, we understand that photography reconstruction of black hole interior is state dependent and complex. And this has been now discussed in many ways. And this seems to be the right way to resolve this paradox. However, uh, in this talk, what I would ask is a very different kind of question is that this black hole complementary principle, which we can barely protect by various mechanisms. How does it emerge itself from a microscopic description? So this is the first question that I don't think uh, has been answered properly. And we have made some progress here. And, uh, and are there some toy models which can explain this? And uh, the second question is there a microscopic model from where within a local, but not necessarily global semi-classical description, uh, where comp battle complementary can emerge without encountering information paradoxes? Uh, so, uh, in this context, the question is uh, is very similar to the page curve like things that you, uh, in, within a semi classical approximation, one could show that uh, one can compute the Renai entropies and, and, uh, and that uh, the semi classical geometry itself can reconstruct the Renai entropy and, 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 have, uh, and show cons consistency with immutability. Similarly, whether you can do something, but the key thing here will be that we are local but not global semi-classical approximation, which I think is very key, which I would explain along the course of the talk. And furthermore, uh, the question is that this black hole is a special kind of coal after all. Uh, so if you just burn coal, I don't think you find anything like black hole complementarity principle emerging. Uh, so, uh, so there's something like a double copy of information happening. So in what sense black holes are special? And uh, so this is another. So what I will do now, I, I will become more precise uh, uh, later, but I will just first discuss these two toy models which are unpublished and explain and, and just show it's not yet a microstate model, um, but yet it will have some features that will explain how black hole complementary can emerge. So uh, here we can take this simple case where you take a some classical system like a classical harmonic oscillator and couple it to JT gravity and see what happens, right? And do, which will what will happen is something that you expect. Uh, uh, so, so it will, the black hole will suck away all the energy from the oscillator. The oscillator will simply damp down to the equilibrium position at uh, x is equal to zero. And, uh, and that's it. And the two systems will decouple from each other. And, uh, and of course, uh, after the <coughs> oscillator settles down, there will be no information of the initial condition where it started from. The oscillator would lose all its information, right? But, uh, well, this is not quite true if the classical system also has large number of degrees of freedom, like if you couple a kinetic gas with a black hole, then actually both systems will have entropies, so this is not, it will be more interesting, but I don't want to discuss that. Um, but here we will see that uh, the situation is very different if you couple a quantum harmonic oscillator to the black hole. So, although the energy is lost, it retains complete information of the initial state, which is quite surprising and 
There is still a decoupling. And this decoupling leads to a double copy of quantum information without cloning. So I would I would try to make it more precise. Yeah. So with examples. So before going before going to the quantum harmonic oscillator, I would uh, like to talk about a simpler example where we couple a qubit with a uh, uh, NADS2 black hole, uh, which is which uh, which uh, which follows Jacky and Tectitle poem gravity. There's probably some kind of an auto correction here, static on Jacky. <laughs> So uh, uh, this, this figure is taken from Piper Johnson's paper. So let me just come with the company. Yeah. So are you looking at a genus one? The genus one part? No, it's the weird, not okay. genus one. <laughs> it just uh, you just mean the disk diagram. Right? Yeah, it's just a <clears throat> So uh, So, uh, so let me just give you some uh, brief introduction to uh, data gravity itself. So, suppose you do some kind of a, a time return acquisition at the boundary, and you also return a metrized row, then uh, this uh, uh, pure radius, pure radius two, will go to some, uh, will, 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 will transform to something like this, which has a mass, and the mass is nothing but the Schwarzian of the time return acquisition. So essentially, uh, the mass of the black hole can be thought of as the cost that you need to, to do this time return equation at the boundary. So this is uh, uh, this is an exact diffeomorphism that takes that preserves the gauge. So this diffeomorphism has been chosen such that any time the gauge is preserved, and this is sort of a unique unique choice that that leaves the time return equation in, inside and uh, uh, to the bulk. And the mass of the black hole is a Schwarzian. Or minus of twice the Schwarzian, and uh, and it gives you the and the cost of and, and the cost of the diffeomorphism is the mass, but the mass can be time dependent. So it's just a brief brief introduction, and uh, the system that we will have is the following. So there's an overall large n square sitting everywhere, and uh, there is this Jacquard title form action. The phi is the capital phi is a dilator, r plus two, and uh, then you have a bulk scalar, the small phi with some mass. There's a given stocking term, and there's an action for the cube. So, of course, I have to say how this uh, the bulk and the cube couples to each other. So, so that I'm going to say below. So then, for the uh, the, the, the the scalar field phi satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation in the geometry. I think I I don't know. So in in, in this geometry, uh, in this one, so the scalar field. Uh, do we have a pointer here? Perhaps? There's a laser pointer on the uh, remote. This one? There's a button that says laser. There's a button that says laser. Maybe it's the other remote. So in this geometry, uh, it satisfies the, the time body equation, and uh, and the phi is dual to some operator in the dual theory, which is this of which is scaling dimension, and uh, the coupling between the uh, between the bulk and the qubit. So the qubit also has order n square action, and that is a little bit artificial. We will see that what we do is to put a very large magnitude of order n square to make it couple. So here, uh, the non-reversible mode of this bulk scalar is given by lambda, which is the order n, times the expectation value of sigma minus. So what are we are doing, we are, we are making this quantum, but we are treating everything in the bulk as classic. So this is similar to, uh, it is very similar to, uh, okay, this is basically a semi-classical approximation where you have gmu is equal to the expectation value of gmu. And suppose the, your some qubit would have the Hamiltonian of the qubit would be equal to would would, to, would, would be a function of g to which satisfies uh, this equation. Uh, so it is uh, so these are often called uh, and this is actually uh, nonlinear because <coughs> the expectation value is always nonlinear in the state. 
So often this is called nonlinear mean field quantum channel. So actually, this is a very big thing now in the community. Uh, in the uh, it, it's uh, it, it, in the quantum information theory community. Uh, sorry, I wrote this nonlinear mean field quantum channel. It's mm -hmm. called in the literature. So uh, so this is one kind of nonlinear quantum channel. So uh, what I what I want to say is that here you are not modifying quantum mechanics. It's simply a stupid mean field approximation. And uh, uh, so this this is the similarly what you're doing here is somewhat similar. Uh, so, so you might wonder why I'm quantizing. Could I just way? ask I, I, yeah. about the terminology? I hadn't heard this before. Mm -hmm. Normally, if you look up quantum channel and say what is that, then it satisfies a couple of things. Of which number one is linear. So is this anyway? So that seems like okay. So that means that it's something completely different. No, no, no. It's or not really what? Different. So it is. If you do any kind of semi-classical <laughs> approximation, you will necessarily end up with a nonlinear channel because you will take an expectation value to be nonlinear in the same. Yeah. And uh, yeah. but this is uh, this is simply a part of this whatever you call this approximation. It's, it's not uh, so uh, so actually this uh, does not even pilot any of these problems. Uh, like uh, it doesn't lead to any superluminal com communication or anything. It's uh, operator like, sum representation still fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, for example, uh, so this is actually very much studied in the quantum information theory literature, and people are even trying to couple them, uh, sorry, classify them recently. So, the reason it doesn't lead to any kind of uh, superluminal communication is that suppose you take an EPR pair, like 1, 0, plus 0, 1, and you couple, say, one of the qubit to, to, to I'm the. I'm not the slightest concerned about that, but, uh, yeah. but, but okay. Yeah, yeah, so if you choose to do some trace, of the second qubit of rho a, uh, which you call rho a, so all your observables will be built out of trace rho a. Uh, so this is the one that's going to couple to uh, that that will couple to the field which is here. Uh, so uh, so and if you read Polchinski's uh, famous critique of the of uh, Weinberg's nonlinear quantum mechanics, he says that uh, this is sufficient in lesser and sufficient condition to not have superluminal propagation. But I, the point of that paper is to say that if you have something like this, it leads to something even worse, which is that it leads to communication across branches of the wavelength. But this is not inconsistency. And it is it is the following inconsistency in that if you make a so the question here is can you have a nonlinear Schrodinger equation? And I have no, 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 there's not a nonlinear Schrodinger. You're introducing a, in the Hamiltonian the density matrix. So the evolution itself is a function of the current density matrix. That is nonlinear. That's why you're saying it's not. No, this actually doesn't lead to any problems. So there is a huge quantum information theory literature where they study such channels, and and in fact, uh, this this they're they're quite estimatory studies. So for example, one of the applications of such channels is to do quantum state discrimination. Like they take two states and and they run run them through this nonlinear channel, and uh, relative entropy can increase. So people are even trying to classify such channels, but uh, but these do not lead to a superluminal form. I know they don't need to superlook, but they need to the following kind of... That's not really inconsistent. Okay, what what, what what just, just, for, just so everyone knows what it is. So if you, it's the following situation. Let's say you measure the qubit, and you find it's up with some probability, and then you find it's down with some probability. So usually you think the wave function collapses. Now let's say the person who found down continues to do some experiments, like evolve. That will cause the density matrix to evolve. And under this kind of evolution, the person who found up, who measured up, will know what the person who found down has done. I mean, that was the point of Kulchinsky's paper. If you write out equations of this kind, you have you have two universes, right? One in which you found up and one in which you found down. Two universes, right? <laughs> you know, there are two branches of the wave if function. If you have an Everettian interpretation. Yeah, so there are two branches of the wave function, and, and this doesn't allow for collapse of the wave function. Usually, if you found up, you don't, you know, you don't know what happens in the battle you lose, but with this kind of evolution, you will know what happens. So I think most of the criticism that uh, Wolczynski was doing was in the context of Weinberg's uh, nonlinear quantum mechanics. It was very different. He has, he has nonlinear observables. No, this we don't have nonlinear observables. His own criticism was that this is it leads to superluminality. Okay, we can discuss this later. I think it has this role. It was exactly to look at evolution of this kind. And the point of that paper was to say this that if, if you put in row, yes, you will avoid superluminality, but you will have communication branches of the wave function, which is even more strange. Okay, so that paper was mostly in the context of Weinberg's nonlinear quantum mechanics. It was not tackling this kind of thing. So, so same, right? in nonlinear, Weinberg's not 
version, you have nonlinear operators. But so, so do you have? Yeah. We don't have nonlinear operators. Operator system. Hamiltonian system. Hamiltonian, you have a Schrodinger equation, and the Hamiltonian knows about the density matrix of the state. No, but this is simply a Hattie fork like approximation. No, so then you have to interpret it in the following way in that you have an ensemble of spins, you have like n plus 1 spins, you measure n of them, and you turn on a Hamiltonian for the n plus 1 that depended on the answer you found for the n. So it's not evolution for one qubit anymore, now it's evolution for an ensemble of qubits. Well, in a way you have it, we have an overall n squared. <laughs> okay, fine. So then, then it's okay. If you have an ensemble of qubits, you yeah. measure n of them, you get some data from that, and then you turn on the Hamiltonian for the n plus 1, which depends on the n of them, it's okay. But it, it runs counter to the, the, uh, the motivation that you presented, which was that uh, you're trying to see how information can be duplicated, right, as happens in a black hole. But if you started with n plus 1 copies of the information to start with, then the fact that you get two, you will get okay, two. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll come to that, yeah. So I, I will make a comment on that. So I, I think the answer to this is uh, okay. So let me first present the results and I will talk. Okay, fine. But just uh, so maybe this doesn't make sense for a single qubit. It only makes sense for an ensemble. For a single qubit, this this would not be consistent with what you can. Like, mm. The moment you put expectation of, of an operator inside of Schrodinger equation, uh, it will not be consistent okay. unless you you interpret it as having an ensemble and saying you know. Yeah, I don't quite follow this argument, but. Anyway, what I want to say that uh, there's a uh, lot of quantum information, very respectable quantum information theorists like Barry Sanders are uh, doing this in the context of superconducting qubits. But very respectable as mean you could put the density matrix in the Schrodinger equation for one qubit, right? That, no, what they're doing is exactly what I'm doing. It's uh, the, I don't know if they're very respectable. If they put the density matrix in the evolution for one qubit, that's just wrong. Right? You, you, you say the Hamiltonian depends on the density matrix. If you no, write, no, write, no, write, no, write down a Schrodinger no, equation, this is simply saying that. This is also what people are doing for computer page code, No, so they are saying the fluctuation of the It might be that the fluctuation of the for example. I'm not doing anything that is what people have not done before. No, no, maybe they need it in an ensemble sense. If you say ensemble, then it's okay. No, I'm just doing the AMM model, for example. The AMM model, what they want to do. There they say the fluctuation of the What model did you say? AMM model. I'll take the first uh, model when they found this page curve. They don't come to anything to expectation value, right? They say the, the fluctuations are small. What happens if you take a semi-classical metric? The fluctuations are small compared to the expectation value. Yeah, yeah. It's not so that's the sigma thing. x squared is going to be small compared to sigma x. You have one qubit, its fluctuations are as large as, and yet you're putting expectation value inside the Hamiltonian, as opposed to taking the full operator, which is Well, that's sigma. also what AMM does. They take the many copies of the same qubit. Way to but they have a CFT where they look, look, these, this line of arguments that other people have done this thing. I, I really look, we have to explain what you do okay. and is yes. this legitimate under what circumstances that other people did it too. I, I really think it's not a legitimate yeah. argument. No, okay, so uh, then let me explain then what, what, what is how the n square counting is working and, and, okay. and, and, and okay. this. Uh, so, this is what uh, what the even people also had in mind, and then I think this will hopefully it will be clear. So, what you're doing here is this. Uh, the non normalizable mode of phi, and this is how you're coupling it, is uh, is proportional to lambda times the expectation value of sigma x. So just uh, like this, and lambda is order n. So that's important. And uh, the bulk uh, scalar then has this solution in this particular background, which I just showed earlier. Uh, this background, the bulk scalar has a solution, and uh, the first term is a non normalizable mode, and this is a non normalizable mode. It's O. And uh, this is also order n, n, because lambda is order n, so O is also order n. And the equation for the mass of the black hole turns out to be this. And where n is order n square, lambda is order n, and O is order n, so this is also order n square. So this equation, for example, is derived by Bata Sena Zang and also by Yas and different rules, but uh, um, so I, have, I have a paper on this, on simulating energies to gravity earlier. So, you, so actually, another way to put this is the mass is uh, the area mass is redefined, and then you have the usual model entity. But but this is another way to put the same thing. Uh, so, so this is the equation that you get for the mass uh, once you couple. Uh, so essentially, you have to solve the qubit and the lambda. Model. So both, both are already squared. Okay. Uh, so you might now wonder why I'm not quantizing this, but quantizing the qubit. Essentially, the justification is that the qubit is one degree of freedom, and this is. So, may, may, could you just explain where this, I mean, is this qubit supposed to be in the interior of the black hole? No, no, it's at the boundary. 
Okay. It's like a boundary. It's, okay. it, 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 it's sourcing the, the boundary condition for phi, right? That's how they so Should I think of the qubit as the path in this case? Is, okay. is, it, is the black hole evaporating into this qubit path? Or? No, no, black hole is not evaporating. Everything is classical here. So the okay. black hole is not. Yeah, but we will bring in the evaporation. So this is just a black hole coupled to a qubit. This is just a black hole, yeah, classical right. black hole. So we are not doing a version of the model where we are also quantizing this power scalar. So then the equation of motion for the qubit is simply this the Hamilton is order n square because the magnetic field is order n square. And this is sigma z and sigma x are operators and always the classical. Okay, so this is the equation, but if you uh, you can do more generally and you can write it as a density matrix uh, where you have uh, this decomposition, and because the uh, eigenvalues of a density matrix would be positive and between 0 and 1, you have this inequality q1 square plus q2 square plus q3 square. That's and, the, and this uh, equations uh, then are simply u1 dot is minus h0 u2, and this, this is a standard this equation that you get. So you just, yeah. In this case, O is will depend on the on the on m, right? Yes. yes. So so in, just to point out, this is the Schrodinger equation, and the yeah. O will depend on the expectation value of sigma x. Because O will depend on uh, what yeah. the other system is. Yes. So so you've written out a Schrodinger equation in which in the Hamiltonian you have the expectation value of some Oh, it's not an expectation value. No, I'm always the value of the scale of, of the scale of the mm -hmm. of the uh, of the uh, field, right? In the JT gravity field. O, o will come from the JT gravity, right? Yes. Yes. So O, o is not an expectation value. O is a, because this bulk scalar is classical. Yes, yes. But the bulk scalar has boundary conditions which depend on the expectation value of this thing. Yeah, yeah. That's so O depends on the expectation value of model sigma. Yeah, that's so why it is not. So if you go to your Schrodinger equation, take on the next slide, please. This Schrodinger equation effectively has the expectation value of sigma x. Yeah, it is state dependent uh, no, no. unitary evolution. No, this is this is just nonlinear evolution. This is not uh, standard quantum. No, but this is uh, this is what people. Are. <laughs> I mean, this is this is this. I mean, this is very not a very something that is very uh, controversial. Then at least you should reason over its ensemble that you have you are looking at the evolution of one qubit and you are using which are, you have n plus one identically prepared qubits. You measure n of them. You can also you interpret it that way. Yeah. But that, that will be very important if you start talking about how many copies of information you get. If you start with infinity and you get two, that is not surprising. If you start with one and you get two, that is surprising. Okay, let let, let me uh, yeah let, let 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 me try to see. If, uh, I will come come to that. So, so the total constant energy of the system is basically the energy of the qubit, the mass of the black hole, and this interaction term which involves uh, the order order in square. Because the magnetic field is order n square two, and you have lambda o times the sigma x expectation value. So this is how it works out, and this is this is very beautiful because uh, what you have is uh, if you look at the mass of the black hole, it, it it goes up by absorbing the energy of the qubit, and it and it's uh, and it plateaus to some constant. The total energy is conserved. The qubit goes, I mean, uh, has energy drained out, and then uh, you have the uh, the, the interaction energy goes to zero, and this is how they, uh, how u1, u2, and u3 looks like if you simulate it. And uh, so, yeah, so what is really interesting, really interesting here is that uh, you don't lose completely the information of the qubit. So if this is an initial density matrix. The output density matrix is always uh, aligned. Right? So you lose the sigma one, sigma two components, and everything becomes aligned to sigma three. And you retain the purity. So the, the purity is retained, and that simply follows from this equation. So if you look at these equations, uh, square root u1 squared plus u2 squared plus u3 squared is constant. The purity is never lost. And, uh, and eigenvalues, and one interesting thing that you can see here, the eigenvalues of both input and output uh, state uh, are, are this. So, the, so because eigenvalues are, are the same, so basically, all the Renai entropies and Hornerman entropy of input and output are same. So you have uh, so here you see one interesting example where this Hornerman entropy doesn't doesn't actually capture information loss because information is really lost because you lose the initial u1 and u2. So you do not know uh, the exact angle on the block sphere. So essentially, you are moving to the uh, z-axis uh, by staying on the same Dalgrove sphere. Uh, so uh, so this is what is often called a decaying quantum. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so, uh, so this is uh, uh, this is how it is. And, uh, sorry, what's the qubit? 
Was the qubit initially in a pure state when you coupled it to the bar? No, not necessarily. You can but be I could do that, state. and you're saying that it will remain in the pure state? If it's a pure state, it will remain a pure state. But then, exactly. if it is, uh, but the purity is constant. Okay. So you're, you're, it's a thing of thought, right? That you want to And then there's a nonlinear map. The evolution is nonlinear, right, so it right. maps it to that, that other thing. I see. So this is not, this is, okay. So if it was linear, it would have not yeah, been yeah. Okay. So if you look into this blackboard ring down now, uh, so this is the blackboard ring down that, uh, that you see. So it has some, it has many things. So it has a DK amplitude. It's a, there's a DK, the oscillations are tied down. There's an amplitude, there's a frequency and all of that. So, uh, so if you look at the DK rate of these oscillations, that actually captures the purity. So from the blackboard ring down, you can actually gain the information of the purity. So in a way, uh, so if you, uh, so the, so essentially one way to see it is that you have two different quantum, decoupled quantum systems, and the input uh, qubit is now copying information twice, one into the blackboard window, and the other one is in the, uh, so but the, the, not only this purity, but also U3 is important. So one way to see this is that you can take uh, all random states on the block sphere and see where it maps to in this DK, uh, DK rate phase and amplitude. So they always line on a two-dimensional plane. So you are able to, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you lose some information, but you are, but the original U3 and the original and the purity is uh, encoded in the black hole ring number. And one thing I want to emphasize is that this black hole ring number is not a linear phenomenon, it's a non-linear phenomenon. Because if you try to do some linear perturbation around the final state, you don't find anything like Wazenable modes. Uh, so you only have to go to non-linear, uh, the second order to see this. So it's very different from the usual polynomial mode we've got. It looks similar. So, uh, so the information is here partly copied twice in a way. So you retain the information of the purity of in the final state or of the initial state here. And uh, the purity is also retained in the decay rate. And additionally, you have U3 in the final uh, blackboard breakdown. So this is where you see that information is partly copied twice. So, but now something very interesting happens. If you take uh, a qubit, and uh, so you take a quantum harmonic oscillator, uh, and you take a superposition of a ground state and the first excited state, what you will see that information is fully and independently copied twice. So this is a more quite drastic thing. So it's important that the output Hilbert space has to be larger than the initial input Hilbert space for this to happen. So, so now I come to the quantum harmonic oscillator. So here you have uh, this uh, uh, just a normal quantum harmonic oscillator coupled to this qubit, and here you couple by the x operator, expectation value of x instead of expectation value of sigma x, and now you have this equation, and you have to solve it self consistently with the, with the evolution of the qubit. I now suppress all this n, n, n to what are exactly similar, and now the conserved energy is the energy of the oscillator plus the mass of the black hole and the interaction energy. And here, a very similar thing happens. So, so how do you, okay, so let me first say, how, how do you solve this equation, uh, this uh, Schrodinger equation? To solve this, what you have to do, you have to define this so-called auxiliary state, or psi and t. Uh, so these are essentially uh, shifted, uh, uh, some shifted uh, ex uh, harm, uh, excited states of the, so you see that you know, instead of x, you have x minus x p t squared and a PPT, and uh, so, uh, so here you have it. And there's a phase factor. The phase is basically omega, the omega t times n plus half energy plus action, uh, action using this xp. So this is a general, uh, this is simply a definition of this state, psi and t. The initial input state is a superposition of the ground state and the first excited state. And if you want to solve this self-consistently, the full solution, here, uh, so this amounts to basically, uh, so this is a state at all times. So there is this uh, extra factors which we call uh, this x zero t and f one t, and there is psi zero t defined here and psi one t defined here. But this would be a solution of a Schrodinger equation, provided x p t satisfies this equation with a lambda o t, and then uh, p t is simply x p dot, and the initial conditions are there. so. Uh, so, uh, so this is how you uh, how you do this, uh, how you solve the system, and, uh, 
And, there, and of course, this to be self consistently solved with the JT gravity and the scalar thing. So, what you find is that the expectation value of x goes to 0, which means that two systems will be coupled. Because the coupling comes only through expectation value of x. If that goes to 0, the two systems will couple. And uh, if you look at the energies, the energy of the black hole again goes up, and the energy of the harmonic oscillator goes down. So, there's some energy sucked up. And then interaction energy goes to 0, and total energy is gone. But, uh, yeah, so, uh, but what happens, uh, the input and output is something really fascinating, right? and this is what they want to So the output state is not really an ideal state like before of the Hamiltonian, but rather it's a, it's a solution of the Schrodinger equation, but it's a time-dependent solution, it's a quantum trajectory. So the energy, is, of course, is conserved because uh, the, the energy goes to a constant even for the, because once you're decoupling, you have this operator equation dh by dt is equal to zero, so expectation value of the energy will be constant, even if it's not a high density. So, uh, so the output trajectory is like this, so you have the same kind of uh, thing, but it's important now, this xt satisfies this equation, homogeneous equation, without a lambda. So this is what is output trajectory. And furthermore, you have the, you have the requirement, the expectation value of xt goes to zero, so which, which is equal to xtt plus this extra factor, and that tells you, and, 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 and this XPT is a solution of this equation, so it has to be capital A and capital B. This determines the quantum trajectory. Once you know capital A and capital B, you know the output state completely. This is, this is the input state, the output state. And it solves all. Where XP solves all these equations, and A and B are the two unknowns. And A and B can be solved from here, declaring that this equals to zero, and A turns out to be this, and B turns out to be this. So you see that from A and B, you can decode the initial theta and phi. So you can completely de decode the initial qubit from the final quantum trajectory. So essentially the story here is that you're, you have these two systems that decouple from each other and each, go, each follow their own individual quantum trajectories after decoupling. And in each of these quantum trajectories, information is copied twice, fully and independently. So the amplitude and phase of the black hole readout also carries complete information on the qubit. So here, if you look at the energy of the, the original energy, the amplitude of the ring down will carry information about it. And this data is not that good because uh, we have just, uh, we have to actually start the time window properly after the ring down starts. And so this, this is now we are making it better, but uh, yeah, this is where some calculation. And the phase of the ring down can be understood from expectation value of x by expectation value of e. And so this will kind of equal. So, uh, so, if you, so basically, if you, if you know, uh, you can then decode the initial qubit from the black hole ring down, and the output quantum trajectory of the maintenance coherence of the thing, <coughs> and also completely determined by initial qubit as explained. And uh, so, we can see that we can recover the initial qubit fully and independently. Information is copied twice and fully copied twice. Okay. So, any questions? At this point, you may need to start with the infinite copies of the if you started with one copy that would set up the whole evolution would not have made sense. Because your evolution is not linear. I mean, if you have non-linear evolution, it doesn't make sense to do continuations. It's true you can start with n copies of the system, and then you can start putting an expectation value on the side in the in, in one copy form. Um yeah, I don't know. I think uh, okay, my interpretation of this is as follows that of course the full quantum mechanics is uh, of course, okay. You can say you can you can say how good the semi-classical approximation should be trusted or not. Uh, but I think, uh, of course, the full quantum mechanics is linear. So my interpretation of this is that when you construct an effective field theory, when you have gravity in it, you effectively do something non-linear, which is fine. Effective field theory can be non-linear. Could we go back to just the qubit evolution piece? You know, when you write the design, just just u one, u two, u three goes to something. You know, uh, you want to go back there? Yes, the U1, U2, just because that is the place where it will come more clear. Just, yeah, exactly, the next slide, please. The U1, U2, you know, the, when you showed the result, U1, U2, U3 goes to. Yeah, exactly that. There is, this is not even satisfied. No Lindblad equation will lead to this evolution. No, of course not, because this is, Lindblad is not unitary. This is unitary. No, no, this is, no, Lindblad is linear. You see, unitarity, you can always. It's non linear unitary. Something like non linear unitary. No, no, see, I mean, this is. This is, that's what I said, I mean, they're not, it's non-linear interior channels that people consider, but, yeah, it not, will not lead to this. 
Let me say one more thing you would get right, in this information. Mm -hmm. So this will be, let's say you, you started with a qubit and the way you obtained the density matrix was by making a measurement. And so somebody obtained half plus half and the other person obtained say minus half or something. So you could get a density matrix that way, which would be half of one plus u three times sigma three. Now let's say the person who got minus half started doing some evolution. Then the experimenter who got plus half will know about what evolution that person did at the end of this because u three will change, right? I really don't know, but I don't know whether you can do measurements twice because you collapse this way. Hey, but here it's not collapsing. I mean, because you have because the evolution because well, because I've not done any measurement. No, because it's not linear. Because this evolution is not linear. So I don't really care. Maybe, Maybe we can discuss this later. Just like the first postulate of quantum mechanics, right? That this evolution is not allowed for a single system. I don't think it is. Uh, it is anything. Uh, it's simply an artifact of stupid Winfield theory. I don't think it is any, anything that... It's an artifact of the mean field theory, yeah. isn't it? Then it's an ensemble. Then you say you have an ensemble of spins, and you're, you're treating one spin separately from the other end. You want the fluctuations to be small. No, th th that evolution is just not quantum mechanics evolution. From no, a single in order to think of it as a mean field theory. Uh, then I think the way you think is, you have n plus 1 identically prepared spins, you measure n, you take the expectation value, of the operator from those n, and you put it back into the n plus one one. Then you can write down a Hamiltonian like that. But then you started with effectively infinite copies of the information to start with. Which is still fine, I would say, if it's still copied, it is. Now you copied it twice. Twice, twice but you twice. started with infinite. So you ended up with. But anyway, my interpretation is simply that when you go from full linear quantum mechanics and quantum gravity to some kind of semi classical description, you are essentially effective field theory, you are basically doing something wrong. But it shows that there is indeed a mechanism in which you can have a double actual complement. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know most of this. But yeah, as I said, I don't think I'm answering fully the question. But here I just have some, some simple thing like if you have a, a classical harmonic <laughs> oscillator, then you have you don't have double complement information. All the energy of the oscillator goes to the ground state, and so you lose information there. So that is important. Just I want to uh, make something about this. Uh, so what Subhat was saying. So if uh, so, we are doing now some experiments in this paper. Uh, so, uh, some thought experiments where you have this two-sided uh, black hole and you couple an entire qubit with the two-sided black hole. And what you can do is to do some measurement here, some measurement here and some measurement here. And uh, of course, if you do just one measurement here, then you automatically this state will collapse. And you will have a, you will have, so essentially you will have typically a positive shock wave and a negative shock wave. And then uh, this can open up a bond between them. So this could lead to some very interesting kind of evolutions uh, that, uh, that might be, uh, so here you can actually, then you do not need the classical channel for, for uh, to, the, class, the information can go from here to here automatically through the bond hole, and you do not need the extra classical channel between them for your calculation. So you can have some non-trivial non new kind of calculation for the process like this. So we are investigating all of that. And what you also see is that uh, if you do some simple measurements on the qubit, then also the information is encoded into the black hole ring down, and you also have a double copy in some sense. So, um, uh, so we'll uh, do this. So now I will come back to the microstate model itself. Uh, but for that, I will have some, uh, uh, firstly, I will have some motivation. So one of the most important ways to understand or test black hole complementarity, for reasons I will mention, is this uh, information mirroring. And information mirroring goes like this, that uh, it was originally proposed by Hayden and Preskill and improved by Sekino and Sustain. Uh, so, um, so you take, throw a very small diary into an old black hole, and uh, this diary is entangled with a reference to it. And this is simply a tool to make an argument. The reference to it actually plays no role, it only plays the role of a and you do. So when you do that, uh, uh, there will be some random imagery, out after which the, this will be a black hole remnant, and there's a small amount of radiation as well. It's important that this radiation is small. So then you can go through page-like argument, and you can argue that there is no mutual information between uh, 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 so uh, S and B prime. So these two will have no mutual information, because this is a larger object, and this is a small object. So the conclusion would be that all the information in the diary is now transferred to R union. So this is called information mirroring. So 
whatever you throw in immediately comes out. Uh, so this is the information mirroring argument. And uh, this happens as scrambling time. And, uh, but if black hole complementarity is true and is consistent with immediately, then we can argue that, uh, that you would be able to decode this information from R union E without knowing anything about the interior. And this is quite important that you will not, you will not need to know, if, okay, it might be model dependent, this decoding will still be model dependent, but it should not depend on this imagery of, of knowing the details of the imagery operator or this deep right, the remnant interior. So you should be able to do that. And we tried to look into some quantum circuit models where such a decoding is possible. And Kitai and Oshita have a brilliant model, but, but that required information of you and uh, this thing. So it required to know what is inside. Given to be the reasoning at all here. So, this is the condition for recovery of the information in B, isn't it? The fact that this unitary thing is perhaps mixing B and D, and you might think that that meant some of the information from B got lost inside of into B bar, B prime. But you're assuming that there's no mutual information, so then no, it's it's a something that you can show with uh, no. some no. arguments like original with B. So. It's important it's a random integer and uh, like drawn from some hard S and B prime should have no mutual information. I believe that's the condition that you're imposing. No, no, no. What you can, you can, you can, this is okay. I didn't write it at full, but it is something that uh, is not a condition, something that follows because the key point is that R is very small what? compared to a D is small compared to B. That's very important. It's not enough that it's small, right? yeah. it has. I mean, the, the either is mutual information is zero or it's not. It is and it's not an approximation, right? It's, uh, well, it's... Uh, I mean, it's something along the lines that it's enough that one system was smaller than the other or something. That's... No, no this is important that... Uh, so it's very similar to the page-like argument. Like the way the page argued is that your page about the page color. So like you take a typical state and it's a very kinematic kind of argument. And, and this is something that is that you can show uh, pretty rigorously. So, if D is small compared to B, then uh, this B prime and S would have no mutual information. Also, R is has to be small. Then the, then the argument is that all the information should be in R union. This, this, this argument was given by Hayden uh, in 2007, actually, way before this uh, even. But I didn't understand still that this was an exact argument. I mean, are you doing a page style argument where you're saying that when one system is parametrically bigger than the other, mm -hmm. then it's true that their mutual entanglement is basically proportional to an identity matrix? Is that what we're doing? Well, because we are... Yeah, okay, but that means also we, we have to randomize, we have to actually integrate over something, we have to randomize over the, the, the combined okay. pure state or something. This is, this is, all that you need is U is sufficiently typical. It's, 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 it's typical, typical exactly. Did I integrate of all possible U's, for example? No, no, no. Okay, you can do that. It's just like a, one way to do it is simply average over all possible uh, That's simply a mathematical tool, but you, all that you do is to say that u is drawn from some random hard measure. U is a, uh, so this will be true even if it is u is. Anyhow, so I, so I understand. That, that, that seems to me like a very, okay, that's a very approximate kind of thing, but okay, fair enough. And it's important it's an old black hole, so e is also sufficiently as large as uh, e. So it's, uh... Okay, so. Whether there is some microscopic model that can do this, and uh, and then also if the semi-classical geometry can be trusted, so this is a radiation that has just come out, and this is the early radiation is very far away from the black hole. So you would also uh, you would also require that you can decode this information in D from R union E, not only by knowing B prime and this U, but also requiring only little information of E because uh, you not, should not require too much information to. Because if it just has come out, uh, if information has come out of an expanding time, then this is very far away, so we should not require. This is simply some uh, requirement that you would like to have. Uh, so this is one way we thought that uh, whether you can have such a model that explains this black hole complementarity. And there are of course some more questions. Um, and so why simple observations see that interior exterior is decoupled and distinguishable if they are not? Uh, so in fact, uh, in the microscopic model, uh, the reverse spaces cannot be factorized, but uh, effectively it becomes factorizable. That's what we will see. And uh, how come we can decode some of the mirrored quantum information fast while the information on the interior is so well hidden in complexity? So, anyway, so these are the kind of questions that we want to do. 
So let me explain this kind of uh, simple model that we came up with, already published. So, uh, so this was just uh, studying classical information mirroring, and later we combined this. Uh, uh, I will talk about how it relates to the toy models I just discussed. Okay, so uh, the talking of the microscopic uh, or microstate model is as follows. So you can have you have basically. Uh, it, is, it is kind of motivated from the fact that the near extreme horizon can fragment into multiple probes. There's a brittle instantum, of course, and also if you take supersymmetric uh, black holes, and it's not a without when the charge vector is not primitive, this can also happen. So, this, is a, this has been discussed earlier, but uh, this is not a very controlled thing that you can study because uh, whenever the throats come very close to each other, you have an abundance of low energy modes, and these are the boundaries of the instantum model. Where the throats are separated by sub length distance. So, so our guess is we make some, some kind of a random guess in order to do this. So, we just take a lattice of fragmented. So, we say that this fragmented throats, so you can think that it's a lattice. If you have, if you have a certain sphere, this sphere is, is a lattice of SYK quantum dots, which are dual containers to black holes. So, they form a lattice, it's R degrees of freedom. And the, uh, and the soft degree of freedom is essentially the original. Uh, symmetry of the unfragmented throat, the SL2 of charges, and they can roam freely, uh, they can roam at all. Uh, so, in fact, they, these throats are coupled to each other via this uh, hair. Uh, so, uh, so this, uh, this hair is delocalized. Uh, so, this hair is simply the traditional SL2 of charges. So, this is a sort of, of course, it's not derived from anything, but uh, it's simply a guess to, to, to see. And the equations. Uh, but, but there's one SO2R, but there's one entire aerosol for each yeah. of the throats, right? So there so is they a don't share one. Yeah, there are SO2R charges, charges at the attached to each throat, and there is a mobile SO2R charge. When you say SO2R charges, but you, do you mean the Schwarzschild charges? I mean, there yes. are no SO2R charges. Yeah, the everything sure. is module SO2R. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, you're right, you're the page charges. So you have this SYK type quantum dots that dual can be to throats, and uh, then this mobile traditional hair, and, uh, and, the, and the, the full system has only one overall SL2 symmetry corresponding to this. Uh, so let me show you the equations now. So this is simply to remind you what are this uh, SL2 charges associated with the torsion. And this is the mass, which is a capacitor, which is just a simple reminder. And these are the equations. So the masses of the throats evolve like this. So this is like a diffusion equation, so this is like box of Q uh, in a way, and this is dot QI prime, where QI is a mobile vibration. So this equation is very important because this is the equation that leads to uh, uh, settling down or relaxation from one microstate to another microstate, as you will see. And the other equation is simply like the time model equation for the hair. These are the mobile SL2 charges, plus there's a source term. And this source term is very important, it should have this particular characteristic. And this actually leads to information mirroring, as you can see. So we have this. Uh, so another thing to note is that uh, sum over QI prime is conserved because if you if I take some sum, if I take this summation of all these equations, the right hand side will vanish. So that is there is one conserved quantity here, the sum over QI prime. And uh, what we should do actually is to one tensor here. If you do some, something like a semi classical approximation, the hair should be completely quantized, but the throats can be treated as classical. So, this is sort of the. But we are not, for, for the moment, we are not quantizing the hair. We are taking only the four ends. So, uh, the total cons of energy of the system will be the sum of the masses of the throats plus the energy of the hair. This is like a kinetic energy, this is like a potential and there are no interaction terms actually, it is conserved But the system opposes interaction so, uh, with each other. But the interaction energy is not, there's no explicit interaction energy. Like for example, you have your chromatism and particles, you simply have the energy of the, of, of the field plus the energy of the particle, but there is no explicit interaction energy. So, we have to now define the microstates of the system, and the microstates of the system are stationary solutions of this equation, which, uh, I wrote down all the static and stationary solutions of this equation, and uh, and these are as follows. So the throats will have will be like a randomizing model. So one of the you can always choose a global frame, and in the global frame, one of the components we can call it zero, 
uh, this is homogeneous. The other two components, they are random and but constant. They can be random values. That is for the throw. So this would be one microscope. And uh, after the hair would have uh, three components. One is a monopole like a component where it is uh, simply linearly going. This is something for the define something like a primordial frame. Uh, so let's explain this later. But a two plus minus are locked to the black hole. So, so these are exactly these two plus minus plus some constant A is independent of the site. And these are localized or locked to the interior. The zero component will have this monopole component plus some radiation component. And this radiation component is simply decoupled and can move freely uh, without interacting with the interior. So it's very important that the microscopes have a very nice characterization of the hair into interior and out exterior, because this is like an exterior, this is interior, but the general solution cannot be split into interior and exterior. The other interesting thing about this model is that if you need, you also need T, T prime and T double prime to be continuous uh, because of the Schwarzschild equation, and uh, therefore you have to have these kind of inequalities or these kind of inequalities. So it's interesting, if you have these inequalities, then you can show that Ti prime has to be greater than 0, or Ti prime. If, if you choose this, then all Ti prime is less than 0. So essentially, a uniform arrow of time emerges from the model. So either all the throats are moving in forward in time, or all the throats are moving backward in time. So we could probably try to also invent some kind of time machine that uh, do a flip, but we have not tried this yet. So, uh, anyway, this I can skip because this is not so important. And, uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, okay, so maybe I can come to this shock. And, uh, so, what happens if you shock a microscope model, or one of these microscopes? So, one of the things that you can see is that we can quickly relax this to another microscope. And if you shock one of the microscopes, and it, all the energy is actually absorbed by the throats, by the, by the black hole by the ADS2 black holes, and very little energy, or almost 0.1% of energy, or even 0.001, depending on number of sites you have. Uh, so more the number of sites, the less of, less of the energy absorbed by the air. So, so, and also it relaxes quickly from one microscope to another microscope. So uh, if you have a shock, the equation changes like this. So you have uh, the same diffusion equation, but then these are the shocks that you are throwing in. This corresponds to null, Non particles or uh, uh, non rays that goes into it is the energy, and A is the uh, is I is the throat and A is the time when we, when we are shocking. So there are different moments of time and different sites you can shock them, and uh, and the shocks are produced by falling non. Now if you do a single shock and the result is very same also to do multiple shocks, then you see that the energy of course increases because the shock has an energy that is absorbed. But hair doesn't change in energy at all. All the energy of the shock goes to the black hole, to the strokes. So this is what this is for three sides. This uh, well, this is a five side so periodic chain with, uh, and the shock is a side one. And this is how this relaxation. So I, if you remember what I said, in a microscope, qi plus minus are constant but are, are random. Qi plus minus is random but constant, whereas qi zero has to be uniform. So that's what, so if you are shocking it, this is what is happening. So qi plus minus starts from some random constant values to another set of random constant values. Here only one side is shocked, that's, that's, that's the, the number one side, but there is actually no pattern to guess what will be the final values. And this is qi plus and this is qi minus. So all of them randomize, so goes from random set of values to another random set of values. So you go from one random microscope to another random microscope. And as you see, the qi zero, they homogenize. As it should have in a microscope. So you relax from one microscope to another microscope. And these are the masses of the work. So, uh, and so, but the final microscope will always have decoupled air oscillations. So now let me explain uh, how does the information mirroring work. So, what happens is that you have this uh, air, which has radiation component. The part, this is in a microscope, the lock, uh, some part is locked. Lock, with the interior, the monopole component, and your shocks plus the charges of the of, of the of, of the throats, uh, then when you shock it, there will be some mixing dynamics which where you cannot separate the interior and outer exterior, but then they will separate out and the radiation component will separate out from the microscope. 
and you will be decoded. And this is the other thing that will happen. So what is very important is decoding protocol should not know, and that is the longitudinal part, about the interior dynamics. So it should be able, it should not depend on which microstate is started. You should microstate in the So from the point of view of decoding protocol, you are basically, you should be thinking of a, uh, of a microcanonical also. So uh, what is happening here is that, uh, um, uh, so what we are doing is that you have, uh, you, you, are sh you, are, you are basically throwing information in the following way. You, it's basically some kind of ordered list where you have the location of the shocks and a time sequence. So it's, a, it's an ordered list of sh locations with a, and this order, the order would correspond to the time sequence. So it will be which of these uh, things were shocked and, uh, and, and, uh, and in which and which was shocked first, which was shocked later. So this is how you are trying to decode it. And the decoding can be done from the uh, from the hair. So the decoupled hair, which is which is purely a separate sub from microstate, will have normal modes, and there will be five normal modes for a five state, but two of them positive, two of them negative, and one zero, so the zero will go here. Uh, and uh, there would be this and, and the amplitudes uh, show, show a lot of not in pattern, but what you have to, the decoding can be done from the phase difference between these two normal mode oscillations. And that's a very surprising thing, it's a very specific observable that does this decoding. So let me illustrate it. So for example, you have done a single shock to this uh, five side model. Then you see this nice pattern, this is a phase difference between the two normal modes. And, uh, and you see there's a nice uh, kind of symmetry, a very good approximate symmetry in the phases. And it's kind of clockwise uh, increasing and increasing uh, like this. So uh, so you see that the one that has the largest phase difference would be the side that has been shot. And this is quite interesting because the original microstate that we started from was very random and it had no symmetry like this to begin with. And uh, so but the phase uh, oscillations have this nice symmetry once you couple. And, uh, and so it's quite interesting that you could do this decoding just by uh, thinking of the uh, interior as a microcarnical ensemble. Now, if you have two shocks, then the, this is the way it goes. Uh, so you have uh, you have one. Uh, uh, so you, you again have a, the largest phase difference and the smallest, okay, smallest phase difference, and the uh, uh, minimal phase difference side was shocked first, and uh, and, and if the shock side at the rest later. So this was shocked first, and this was shocked later. Again, you see a nice pattern. You see some clockwise pattern here, although the initial microstate is very random. And can be, and this is true for any microstate. You find such a pattern. And uh, and then this is an example where where you have non-neighboring sites that have been shocked. In this case, the minimal phase minimal phase difference was shocked later. This was shocked later. This was. So the point is that you can have a decoding protocol that doesn't care about the microstate, and where you can see the information mirroring happening in a precise way that is consistent with lack of complementary. But then uh, uh, I will come to the part is uh, when you add Hawking radiation. So far, we took the throats. Uh, Without hopping radiation, uh, then what happens? Uh, but before that, is there any question on this part? Okay, if not, then I move ahead. So uh, now the interesting part, actually the most interesting part happens when you add the hopping radiation. So how do you introduce hopping radiation is that you think of each 2D throat independently. Uh, you can think of each 2D throat like an EMM model. We have some CFT interacting with the throat, and uh, again, you do a mean field like approximation, and, and it will radiate Hawking pointer to some, uh, to some reservoir. And uh, so, this is exactly like in the page talk model. You can, you can model each uh, throat independently. And the Hawking pointer doesn't interact in directly with the hair. And the hopping point emitted from various throats also do not interact at And the masses of each throat start evaporating, so each of the masses start going down. Okay? So I will just take five more minutes. So this is because, uh, this, okay, so this is what we see. So what you find also that if you look at QI zero components, uh, these also start homogenizing very soon, extremely fast. On a very faster time scale, they come. And uh, so uh, this is like an evaporating microstate because in the microstate, you, what you want is that the QI zero components are homogeneous, and here what you find is exactly that. And that uh, it, although it's, it's evaporating, it quickly relaxes from microstate in the sense that 
the homogeneous scale, although they're working. And what happens is also very remarkable that if you look at a very, very long time scale, much, much longer time scale, then qi plus and qi minus also homogeneous. So not only the masses go to zero, but also all the qi plus and qi minus components were homogeneous. And this is a consequence of decoupling. So basically what happens is that all the floors start decoupling from each other. The hair also starts decoupling from the floor. So everything starts decoupling from it. So you might think that this is uh, very bad because uh, after all we started with a lot of information, but now everything homogenizes, and everything becomes, uh, you know, very blunt. Uh, so actually what happens, uh, but here is exactly what we, what we need actually, uh, uh, because, it, because of the decoupling you can have multiple copies of the same information. So what happens is as follows. So if you, if you put four points of information, like a qubit, like we said in the initial tutorial models, so if you will mirror it very quickly on this qi0 of the, on short time scales, and uh, uh, that is something that we would, okay, so sorry, what is, that's on the next step. So the force decoupled from each other asymptotically, they also decouple from the air, but this is what precisely what we need for copying information without cloning it. The ringdown of the source will input imprint information into the hopping pointer. So now, uh, because of the ringdown, so right now we have also figured out how to, even without hopping radiation, if you look at boundary correlation functions, you are also able to decode this uh, information of the qubit uh, from it, but you can also decode it, but we don't know exactly how, but uh, it should be in principle, because of the ringdown will carry the information of the, of the initial state and the and informing qubits, so, uh, so that will, uh, that will, so there will be many, many such ringdowns, and uh, you can also have entangled qubits, uh, uh, you know, like different throws coupled to entangled qubits and whatnot. So all of this would be copied by the ringdown of the, all these throws, and they will imprint all this information uh, of the qubits, of the informing qubits, uh, into the uh, hopping one. So, uh, so they will have a hopping rate. The imprinting should be complex and conditioned by the history of the microstate. Uh, so still you would like to have it be partially reconstructed without decoding the interior. This is something we don't know, and it's something that we're trying to figure out. And so we are, in this model, you could actually repeat what we have done. So it's, a, it's exactly the same computation that we did before, but with multiple throws. So this is a durable computation, we are doing it now. However, the decoding of the same information in the hair can be done very rapidly and without the knowledge of the interior. So essentially, this is, uh, so the information is copied twice because the hair would carry the information. And that you can do it very rapidly and without knowledge of the interior. And we are specifically understanding these issues. Uh, so we are specifically understanding whether the decoding, maybe a post print information can also be decoded from the hopping radiation without knowing about uh, the interior. So that's an interesting question. We don't know the answer yet. So, so anyway, this is a, not a very, uh, the toy model is also not too realistic. Uh, there could be many other better models that uh, can, can help here. So one interesting thing that you can do, you can make the uh, the throats connect with each other, and in that way you can mimic something like an SYK, many entangled SYK pure spin, spin states. If you form a network of these throats, it will be dual to some very complicated SYK. It will be more like a pure state rather than some. So you can do many more interesting things like this, and, and uh, maybe there should be some derivation of it, a more realistic kind of justification coming from first volumes or something. So there are uh, several so conclusions are as follows. So we have a reasonably uh, good phenomenological model of a quantum black hole that gives insights into the origins of black hole complementarity while exhibiting right classical behavior. So it has this classical relaxation and energy absorption. So it relaxes from one microstate to another microstate very quickly while absorbing most of the energy in the interior where you have this mirroring without energy, without energy coming out. Uh, so this is a very, uh, and we also understand this actualization. Uh, horizon here actually plays a very important role in this uh, act, operational factorization of the simple spaces. The mutual decoupling of all degrees of freedom from each other copies information to the interior in very complex way. Uh, uh, this is something that I didn't explain. This fantastic weak measurement. Uh, so this this whole thing called quantum weak measurement theory, in which what you do, you couple a qubit to some of ancilla, a large ancilla, and will do a strong measurement on ancilla. So that way you can take out the mean value of some of the, not, not the statistics of the observable, but you can extract the mean value of the observable very quickly and very nicely, often by a single shot measurement. And uh, so that's the theory of quantum weak measurement. But in this uh, way, what you need to happen is that these two systems decouple from each other. 
we by do the decoupling by hand. So what is happening here is something similar, except that the decoupling is happening automatically by dynamics, not by not something that you're doing by hand. And you're also also having a double copy, and uh, that is because the information is probably being is actually being uh, is actually being uh, uh, imported into the uh, in, into this one line of So you have this uh, black hole readout, uh, which we saw here. This is close like this. So this black hole readout is essentially a, a type three one uh, one line of So actually. Uh, so about the question of non-linearity, uh, uh, this is similar observations have been made by Hong Liu and uh, by Kersar, uh, that uh, if you, for example, take into account uh, uh, only large uh, single trace operators and forget about uh, you know multi-trace operators, you get an effectively non-linear theory, and uh, if they form some kind of one dimensional algebra. And uh, so here, the one dimensional algebra plays a very important role. It's, the information is not being copied into a state, but rather into an algebra. So this actually tells you that we probably need some new understanding of quantum weak measurement theory in the language of quantum algebra, and uh, and this is also very fascinating consequences for quantum control theory because in quantum control, what you want to do is that you want to uh, you want to basically uh, do some measurement in this particular ancilla and you repeated measurement. You want to control the trajectory of the of the qubit that is being coupled. So here also we find that. Uh, you start with a qubit, but the end output is some interesting quantum trajectory. So you can actually, so the question is whether you can, it's the applications of quantum control, and, and maybe if, uh, I'll explain this one later, but I don't have time for it. So you can have many other applications of studying of such uh, microscope models. And a strange metal is that perhaps acts very much like a black hole microscope. Actually, uh, this may be surprising. And so uh, we can think of a strange metal models like uh, some lattice of SYK quantum dots and with electrons hopping around. And uh, in this kind of models, what we have shown is that uh, you, you, you can have uh, many parameters, of course, but you get something like a universal spectral function. Uh, and this is something that we are actually uh, fitted to, 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 uh, to, to data, to actually RPS data from nature physics. So now our paper is being reviewed in PR, we have already got very good comments on the record. See through, so uh, so uh, so that explains a lot of these transport properties like uh, linear interacivity. Uh, so and the decoupling between different flows explain the origin of this uh, why the self energy is local. That is it. It is staying dependent. So uh, so yeah. anyway. So this is a uh, this is something that is uh, that is uh, um, that we, uh, so black holes basically are very special objects and black hole complementary may be simulated also using some. Some of the strange methods of motion. So I think that uh, this is the more or less the conclusion. And uh, thanks for listening. Yeah.